Good afternoon. Well, first of all, let me welcome all of you uh, to our new uh, forum. Uh, this is going to be our first lecture in our new science, technology, and policy forum at CMU. Um, as you've seen, I'm sure, in previous email messages that uh, through these lectures, panels, and roundtable discussions, the forum aims to spark dynamic, campus-wide dialogue on scientific and technological innovations and their potential societal and policy impact. Uh, there's probably no better way to kick off this uh, science, technology, and policy forum than to have uh, my good friend, uh, Jim Carusi, who's here with us today. I don't think Jim requires an introduction. I want to give him as much time uh, uh, for this, but let me just say a few words. As, as all of you know, Jim currently serves as assistant director of the National Science Foundation for Computer Information Science and Engineering. In his role, Jim is responsible for the size directorate, of course, with an annual budget of 900 million and growing, right, Jim? 954. Uh, 954 <laughs> and growing, as I said, uh, in its mission uh, to uphold nation's leadership in scientific discovery and in engineering innovation through its support of fundamental research in computer information science and engineering, of course, state-of-the-art cyber infrastructure and education and workforce development. As all of you know, uh, while at NSF, Jim, of course, is on leave from UMass at Amherst. He's been on the faculty at UMass since, gosh, 2004? Uh, 1984. So 1984. <laughs> And he's been a distinguished professor at the School of Computer Science 2004. I was going to say 2004. That doesn't sound right. Um, uh, and of course, as all of you know, Jim, Jim is a highly uh, decorated, distinguished colleague, well regarded in the community for his research and education. His interest uh, is broad computer networks, architecture, network measurements, sensor networks, multimedia communication modeling, and performance evaluation. He's co-authored a book. Computer Networking, a Top-Down Approach, which is in its sixth edition, widely used across the country. Uh, but more importantly, I want to thank Jim for his service at the National Science Foundation and also for all the fresh thinking that he's brought uh, to, this, uh, to this role at NSF. With that, please join us at the podium and let's give a warm welcome to Jim. It's, it's really, really nice to be here. Is my mic sounding OK? Good. OK, great. Um, I've been here before as sort of a faculty member giving talks in the networking group and stuff like that, but sort of my first, uh, first time here in this uh, particular official role here. And so uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you sort of an overview of activities going on within the size, within the size directorate, talk a little bit, you know, big picture about what we're doing, dive down into a couple of programs that I think, uh, in areas that I think will be of particular uh, interest to folks here. And then uh, I, I'd like to point out what I see as some future challenges. And you know, we don't just say challenges, we always say challenges and, and opportunities, OK? So, but actually, before I get started, so this is going to be like a little love fest here, I think, between <laughs> me and Farnham. So, uh, I, I, you know, Farnham said I'm bringing fresh thinking to the job. I don't know about that, but because I'm following Farnham, as you all know, he was, uh, the AD of size before that. I, I, I was looking at this going over my slide. It almost looks like an obituary. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry about that. But really, uh, Farnham has given, left me a size 18 pair of shoes to fill because he's just done amazing things for the, uh, for the foundation and for the size directorate in terms of the leadership and uh, the new programs launched, some of which I'm going to be talking about today. His stewardship, I mean, we rotate, the ADs rotate through these positions and you know, I think we have a very strong sense of community and history going all the way back. I mean, I've talked to all of the ADs from size going back into the 1990s to get their perspectives. And I feel that, like Farnham, I'm very much a steward of, of a very long and, and important and proud tradition there. Um, and the team that he's assembled there and I've inherited, and now we're bringing in some new people too, as other people rotate out, uh, really a fantastic group of people. So uh, I want to publicly uh, so you know him as your provost, right? Actually, I had uh, an AD from SBE as my provost, and I will tell you she is the best provost I had in 32 years at the University of Massachusetts. Cora Merrick was my, uh, was my provost. And so I, I hope you have 
the great warm fuzzy feelings for Farnham that I had for, for my programs. <laughs> so thank you, Farnham. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start at the very beginning. I'm a computer scientist. We all think top down, right? And so uh, I think everybody here knows that the role of the National Science Foundation, you know, probably the most important thing, promoting the progress of science. What you probably may not know is that in the Organic Act, the NSF is also called on to advance national health, prosperity, and welfare, secure the national defense. And so, you know, certainly first and foremost, as it shows up up there, uh, pushing forward the frontier of science is absolutely what we do. Um, and I want to, uh, well, I'll come back to that in just a second. Let, let, let me say, first of all, I, I feel a little bit like Forrest Gump. You know, you, you sort of end up at a point and you say, like, how did I get here? Because all the good things, I mean, so many good things are happening now for our discipline. And so what you see up here, um, these are five presidential, five ongoing presidential initiatives where the White House and OSTP says these are, uh, these are, are initiatives that are of national importance. So folks here uh, know certainly about the National Robotics uh, Initiative, uh, the, the Big Data Initiative, the Brain Initiative there on, um, uh, July 28th, uh, the president announced a national strategic computing initiative. Randy here. Uh, okay, so uh, and, and and Randy played a huge role in in creating that in his leave from here for OSTP uh, for a year. And then just uh, two weeks ago, uh, the president announced the Smart Cities Initiative. And actually, Pittsburgh played a very important role there. Your mayor was there at the White House and, um, and, and Farnham was on a, on a panel there. So, you know, if we think as computer scientists, where do we sort of fit in the national psyche and in the administration psyche about the importance of what we do? We're really there front and center. So it's really, it's, it's uh, uh, I think, a pretty special time. I can't really think, I've been in the field for, some of you have been in longer, but probably not many of you, and I, I, we're really at a tremendously important time now. So those are the administrative priorities. We have continuing priorities uh, within the size directorate, securing cyberspace, and I'll, I'll drop down into some of these a little bit later, talking about computer and network systems, the work we're doing in education and workforce uh, development, uh, the work going on in, in learning and augmenting human capabilities, and then finally, some of the theoretical foundations of our field. So these you know, this administration priorities clearly were, were, were tremendously important players there. And here, some of our continuing priorities. Okay, so, you know, in a sense, uh, that's sort of the big picture of some of the, you know, big ideas and, and big areas going on. I want to now move from the research, you know, pushing forward the research frontiers in these areas to just a couple of words about economic competitiveness and, and the importance of our field for the country in, in, in that sense. And so, uh, I know, I feel like I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle here, right? So you all get how important uh, information technology has been uh, to the economy. And here, here are just a couple of figures that come from National uh, <coughs> Academy reports. But I want to focus not just on the impact, but sort of how that impact happens. And I'm, I'm curious here, how many people know what the tire tracks diagram is? How about Brooks Sutherland diagram? That's what it was. So I gave a talk at Stanford last week. Uh, they have a higher percentage of people who've, who've heard of it than you folks. But now you'll all have heard of it. And I said, how many people have heard of the tire tracks diagram? And I think about a quarter of the people. And then I showed it, which is this. And I'll talk about it in a second. And then a couple people shouted, oh, that's Brooks Sutherland, which it is. That's where it first came from. And then 50% said they, they'd seen it before. But I want to, uh, the reason I'm putting it up here is I wanted to, to show you, I mean, this is a graphic illustration of something incredibly important and really a beautiful illustration, I think, of the interplay between what we do in, as university researchers and the role of federal government in, in funding um, and enabling university researchers, what happens in industry and product lines here. So you see these lines going up. I'm going to focus on networking here. It's my area. And so what you see here is sort of in, in networking starting in the 1970s, the notion of packet switching and, uh, you know, really DARPA was making the primary investments uh, here at the time and then sort of going up through now. Uh, this is when industry started picking up on it. The green line is when 
this area became a $1 billion product area, and when it gets fatter, that's when it's, it's $10 billion. And unfortunately, what you can't see here quite as well is there are arrows going back and forth there. And those arrows that come from university to industry and industry back to, to universities, that is the flow, sort of the documented flow of ideas and people that go back and forth. And this is sort of getting at the economic competitiveness aspect of what I was saying, that ideas that are starting in universities or maybe starting in industry research labs cross-pollinating as people move, as students move, as papers get published, as systems get built and ideas get taken up. And, and, and I really want to say, I've traveled around, I saw a friend from India here, right? So uh, I, I've traveled around the world a lot and I really think that this is almost a uniquely uh, sort of US way of this really interesting <coughs> collaboration between universities uh, and industries. And so I've said that for, you know, there's networking, software technologies. Let me simply say, you know, pick almost your favorite area of computer science. So this is, this is actually the full graphic from a National Academy report. Um, if you were to uh, Bing or Google or search for uh, uh, tire tracks and uh, computer science, you'd get, you'd get this report. And so across many, many different fields and with companies that are sort of formed on these technologies, you can see what the impact of our discipline is on, on, on the national economy and on lots of different uh, technologies. So one of the problems is that this ends at 2010. We're updating it now. But you know, one of the questions I sometimes get, and Farnham probably heard this too, is people saying, oh, you know, you can only take credit for the internet for so many years. And now it's like, what have you done for me lately? Well, uh, and you know, I get that, right? And, th and that's absolutely true. You know, if I were to come over to networking and talk about software-defined networking, which is already now itself a billion dollar plus industry, I mean, that has its roots actually in an expeditions project that we funded in two th one of the very first expeditions projects we funded in 2007. So I think there are really good stories. I mean, they're not, I mean, they're true, right? They're not story stories. Uh, uh, there are really good arguments that we're continuing to make those kinds of um, investments that then have this natural flow <coughs> into industry and back and forth. Uh, but actually, when people say, what have you done for me lately, I, I, I give that as an example. But I also like to, uh, this is actually a slide I got from Farnham coming up. Uh, it's like, what we're going to do for you in the future also. And so uh, this is a, a graphic taken from a, a McKinsey report from about two years ago that talks about the top 12 economically disruptive technologies by 2025. Um, and I'll, I'll read the stuff over here on the left-hand side, autonomous, near autonomous vehicles, right? Coles to Newcastle, uh, advanced robotics, ditto, cloud technology, internet of things, automation of knowledge work, uh, mobile internet over here. You see 3D printing, energy storage, materials. And if you look at that, I don't know, through my eyes, I look at that and I say, oh, I see computing everywhere through all of those, right? And, and certainly in this column here. And you might think that, oh, these must be the 12 most disruptive computing or IT technologies. Absolutely not, right? Across all areas, these are at least McKinsey's prediction about what are going to be the 12 most disruptive technologies. And so I think looking forward, our discipline also has a very central role in terms of the impact that it, it's going to have. So that was just, I wanted to touch just a little bit before we proceed on, on some of the economic impact of the, uh, of the work that we have. Uh, trying to see how, uh, sometimes it's hard for me to tell graduate students from faculty, but some of you look like students uh, to me. And when we think about, you know, where are the jobs going to be over the next, uh, you know, 10 years? So this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics 2012 to 2022, saying that 57% of all of the STEM jobs uh, are in the computing uh, occupation. So as, as Farna mentioned, I come from Massachusetts and our last governor did a billion dollar statewide initiative in, um, in life sciences. And the digital economy is still pretty big in Massachusetts. And so all of the, you know, all of the computing and networking and IT software companies are all saying, where's our love, right? You know, where's our, our I don't know, billion dollar investment. And we didn't quite get that, but 
it got ramped up, which was great. Uh, but I think this speaks to you know, the importance of computing uh, you know, when we think about where the job growth is going to be, and jobs are incredibly, uh, incredibly important, especially to our students more and more these days. And so, again, I think it speaks to the central role that we play, not just in research now, but in education as well. So, uh, when I go out and talk about computer science, I, you know, or sorry, computer and information <coughs> science and engineering, uh, you know, I always like to leave this message with folks that it's an exciting, obviously important, impactful time uh, to be in our discipline. Okay, so what I'd like to do next is I'd like to dive down a little bit, sort of a little bit deeper into some of the programs that we're doing within size at NSF, but um, I've been a teacher long enough to know you, you shouldn't just get up and start talking, 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 talking. So any, any comments? Or, oh, great. Oh, hey. I would say that if we're pitching NSF's impact, it's not just the tire tracks, it is the people that you... Those you arrows going back and forth, yeah. Just creating the people, financing people to go through PhDs has had an extra impact on the economy Okay. the direct introduction of the Okay. Great point. I guess I've, I've learned that as a faculty member when interacting with industry. Sometimes, I think when I was younger, I used to think, it's the brilliance of my research that's sort of attracting industry and stuff like that. And then I think over time I realized like, okay, they thought that was reasonable, but what they really wanted was access to my graduate students and, and, and sort of the, the workforce side of things. I don't know, maybe you folks have different experiences, but it's, it's absolutely true, yeah. Any other comments? Yeah. Well, you have some words in there that I like, but I, I don't think they're connected the way they should be. You okay. Said sustainable U.S. competitiveness. Uh huh. What about sustainability for U.S. competitiveness? And we are not moving in the right direction in this country, politically and otherwise. Uh, for instance, in Pittsburgh, and you mentioned the mayor. Yep. We have three trains a day. I took them to Ludwigsburg with 90,000 people. They have 100 trains, and within 10 minutes, we have 500 trains. Uh huh. And we don't have to fly to Paris. We take a train which goes faster. And the United States is not pursuing this kind of vision. And when I was in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, the Chinese are building metro lines there. Okay. Yeah, I remember when the airport in Hong Kong was being built, the new airport in Hong yeah. Kong, thinking, wow, when's the last time we in the U.S. undertook an infrastructure project of that size? So, I mean, I guess I agree with you. I'm going to get a little bit, I mean, sort of coming back to what's happening in <laughs> cities and also specifically what's happening here in Pittsburgh. When I want to touch on smart cities. Right. And, and, and that's only part of the investment that I know you're talking about. But right. Okay. But computer science has a very, very important issue with data analytics and data, but we need to have a vision of what the data means. Absolutely, right? And that's going to be driven by the kinds of applications that are going to be using that. So and industry interest. And industry interest too. So I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to spend, I, I do want to spend a little well, bit of time. thank you very much. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, all right, so oh, I have an org chart. I'm sorry. You never want to see an org chart, but, but just so that you know, that we at NSF divide ourselves up in uh, NSF size. We divide ourselves up into four, uh, four divisions. So the Division of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure, that's actually a division that serves all of science and engineering across the, across the foundation. And it's absolutely not just Big Iron, although we do have a number of facilities, including one at the Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center here that uh, receives significant support. So we do have HPC, but there's a lot of, as you just mentioned, a lot of interest in data, networking and cybersecurity. So we have programs for high bandwidth connectivity uh, for campuses, 125 plus of those awards recently. And then software, software, software. Software being just incredibly important. I'll come back to that when we talk about the, the NSCI. This is our uh, computing and communications foundations. This is where hardware and software foundations, communication theory, information <coughs> theory uh, reside. And, uh, and of course, uh, the algorithmic foundations. And then finally, I guess this is sort of what used to be my home directorate, computer uh, and network systems, computer systems uh, and networking systems, basically. And this, actually, this is the area, if you look at numbers of proposals coming in and sort of, uh, sort of grant funding pressure, this uh, uh, division over here, information and intelligence systems. Uh, so this has cyber human systems. This is where robotics, machine learning, all of uh, those topics 
uh, uh, reside, it's, it's, it's certainly the directorate that we're seeing the most growth in. Uh, okay. Okay. Last org chart. I promise. Whoops. Okay. All right. So a little bit about NSF by the numbers, just so that you you're sort of familiar with with uh, I don't know. It'll it'll give you an idea of size. So so uh, for our 2014 budget, um, you know, Farnham mentioned 900 million dollars. We just closed out 2015. We don't have the final expenditures. Those will be about 925. Fiscal 2016, which we're just starting, but on a continuing resolution, uh, 954 million is our uh, is the budget request. You're probably most interested in things like the success rate. So a success rate of 23 percent, and that's across all of the programs that we have, taking out like workshop reports and travel grants for students and uh, eagers and things like that, which are you know sort of 100 percent hit rates or, or very high. Uh, hit rates, you know, I'll say it's been going down slowly over time. Uh, our career numbers tend to be a little bit higher than that. Some of the other ones, because we've been really pushing hard to make investments in our junior faculty. Um, uh, in some of the other programs, it's certainly less than 23%. Less than but that's what it is um, across all of size. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just focus here a little bit on people, because in the end, as Andrew mentioned, it's all about people. Right? And so uh, senior researchers, 6,600 senior researchers funded, uh, approximately an equal number of graduate students and a large number of undergraduate students that are funded also. So I know you all are probably aware of our research experience for undergraduate program, which is uh, you know, really very important to the, I mean, it's across the whole foundation and incredibly important. So that's a little bit of size by the numbers. I want to show you a graphic just sort of to show you what the, uh, these are the budget realities that we live in. And so, uh, you know, what you can see here is that actually in some of these years, the NSF budget actually went down. The size budget has been doing relatively well comparatively. And so you see three, four, five uh, percent increases uh, per year. And that's just showing the breakdown uh, over the different divisions. People say sort of jokingly that, you know, five percent is the new doubling. Uh, you know, it's just the budget reality that we face right now. And I want to come back later to this issue of uh, how we can expand the opportunities for, for PIs, in particular by, by teaming with other, uh, other agencies and, and, and with industry as well, I believe. Okay, and there's the number, you can't quite see it, but for fiscal 2016, our budget request is 954 million. And I think this is the last graphic on, on, on numbers. Where does our money go? Uh, where, are the, where does the funding go? Well, first of all, uh, I, I guess the point here is that 66, so two-thirds of the funding that goes out from size goes to computer and information science, computer engineering departments, but a full third of it is going to other engineering departments, to the sciences and humanities, and to some of the interdisciplinary centers. And so I think, again, uh, I had a wonderful conversation with a number of folks here right before coming coming here about the interdisciplinary nature of, of research. And I think especially here, it's another one of these calls to Newcastle, I mean, the amount of interdisciplinary research that goes on here s pretty seamlessly as far as I can tell. I mean, people just naturally work together across disciplines. I, you know, I think that's where our discipline, you know, a third of our funding is going to uh, disciplines outside sort of the traditional computer science discipline. Okay, uh, okay. so I, I want to talk a little bit now more about some technical topics and, and I, was, I was challenged by our, uh, our director to give her one slide about what size was about. So in one slide, and you had to explain all of computer science and where it was going over 15 years, how would you do that? Okay, so I want to, I, I love comments on this. I've shown it to her already, but uh, it was a little bit of a challenge to put together. It's got animations, of course, because you can't do it in just one slide, right? But it's visually one slide, okay? So um, we were talking about this in an earlier meeting here about, yeah, we're very interdisciplinary, right? But to be interdisciplinary, you need strengths in your foundational areas, right? So we have the core that of, of computing that we fund through, um, uh, through, through, through core solicitations, and, and these are just 
some of them. I hope I haven't left people out. When I showed this to some of the other uh, folks at NSF, uh, and, and one person didn't see themselves in there, I immediately had somebody in my office, like 30 <laughs> seconds after I walked out of the room. And they're in there now. I won't tell you who it is. Um, so, so, so we have the core, OK? And, and here's a thought experiment. And, and I know you folks do these kinds of things. Project yourself to 2030 and look back and say, what are the changes, what are the big sort of macroscopic changes in the discipline that you see in 2030 looking back to 2015, right? So it's another way of thinking about where's our discipline going uh, over, the, over that time frame. And, and well, let me just show you sort of how I've been talking about this, right? So, you know, certainly we have sort of the technical uh, hardware building blocks and, and so far, uh, you know, it's primarily electrical and, and based on CMOS technology. And I think that, you know, thinking further ahead, so you've all heard, you know, you all know about sort of uh, Moore's Law and uh, maybe it's running out of steam and we have different technologies actually for pushing CMOS technology forward more, uh, but we're not sort of getting the, the, the gains that we used to get simply by miniaturization. So thinking, you know, on beyond electrical, if you will, the physicalness of computing may very well change. And, and so certainly, uh, you know, molecular computing, quantum computing, here are some ideas of what computing might look like, at, you know, sort of far out in, in the 2030 time frame. This one I think is much easier to realize. If you ask, depending on how old you are, or think about this, how do you think your grandkids or your kids, if you're young, uh, will think about computing in 2030, right, in 15 years? So, uh, for me, I think about my grandkids, uh, my yet unborn grandkids. Uh, you know, we think about platforms, right? Think about servers and pizza boxes and, and racks and PCs and, and, and maybe phones and things like that. But that I know already that part of the big vision here is that, you know, computing, I, I firmly believe that my grandkids will not think of computers as, you know, this thing here that I type into, but something that just infuses the entire environment, right? And this vision has been around, you know, for Mike uh, Weezer and, and others for, for quite a long time. I think we're finally beginning to realize that as we see computing embedded more and more. And so I think this is a, a pretty sure thing. Smart vehicles and buildings. I know, heard that a building that's going up, I forget what's being housed over there, but one of your buildings is going to be completely, uh, completely sensorized, cyber physical systems, smart cities. Uh, so I think this is changing, if you will, you know, the notion of what computing means, computing beyond the box. Um, here, this is sort of the interaction between humans and computers. So, so this I actually, I showed at my departmental retreat. So last fall I was a faculty member at UMass and we're sitting around thinking, okay, where should we, we do this every year, where should we be making investments? What are really important areas? And, uh, when I got my five minutes to pound on the table, I was talking about, you know, this was an area that I think if we're going to see the most profound changes between now and 2030, it's likely to come in these, uh, these areas where uh, computing, assistive technologies uh, uh, for people, effective computing, societal informatics, man-machine uh, uh, man interfaces, uh, brain-machine uh, interfaces. And so I called just called that on beyond HCI. And then finally, uh, I'm not sure we have stovepiped applications, but I wanted to sort of set this up, so I said we did. Um, you know, th this, this notion that uh, integration, exactly the kind of things that I know are central to what you folks are doing here, that we don't have stovepipe systems. If you think about smart and connected communities, the essence of that is to get a network effect among all of these different sectors that are united by their use of, uh, uh, of computing. Okay, so that's my one slide that I showed to the director. Any, yes, I was gonna ask if there were any comments. Great. So, uh, so, so I, I'm a self-proclaimed geek. I, I like the toys and, and shiny objects, okay. but I wonder where there are so many sort of human problems. And all of this sort of starts with the opportunities for technology and science, but it's not, where does, the sort of the challenges to sort of humanity 
sort of come in here and affect it? Only sort of like, okay, now we've got to figure out how to write question two, or is there a way that it's brought in more holistically? So are you saying, in, in the sense if I think about how computing is impacting how, how, you know, how our societies form and function? Or it's more like there's, you know, there are problems with hunger, there's problems right. with war, there's problems with that. Do we have anything to say starting with that? I or do we wait until we invent something cool and then see where it can be applied? Yeah, well, I, I, I guess it's, it's, it's certainly the case that if we think about you know, food, energy, and water systems, for example, I'll talk about that in a little while, but there are many, many applications of computing here, and I guess I probably would have put that up in societal applications. So I think absolutely computing, um, I mean, first of all, just in terms of understanding understanding climate, understanding the coupled systems that, that form the climate, and then uh, you know, if, uh, I'm gonna talk in a little bit about uh, the nexus of food, energy, and water systems, which is actually a priority, and computing plays a very important role there. So I guess if I had to shoehorn, I mean, I did have that idea sort of <coughs> up there in the top right-hand corner, but uh, I think you're right in the sense that maybe because I'll agree with you that I'm a geek too, that I sort of start from the center and work out as opposed to thinking from, you know, the bigger picture and top down back to the technology. Yes? Uh, so one thing that I'm a little bit unsure of and you most certainly thought of that is, um, so a lot of these algorithms, a lot of these, well, engineering advances, a lot of, you know, what you have here in the interaction works only if you have access to the data that drives it. Yeah. And a lot of this data is starting to accumulate essentially in companies, large companies, and they are usually very happy if you go there and work there for a year or two. But then after you yeah. go back, it's a lot harder to work on this data yeah. to actually experiment because people get upset if they are experimented upon, as Facebook found out the hard way. Yep. And so how do we solve this? Okay. So uh, I, I'm glad you raised that actually for two reasons. So first of all, I'm, I, I want to talk about that later under my challenges and opportunities part. But, but I want to say also, so you mentioned data, uh, you know, one could say software, one could say uh, security for instance. And so there are elements of computing that sort of cut across this. I mean, when you have only one slide, you sort of have to take a certain cut through it. And there are these kind of tech, you know, uh, maybe technologies, areas like data and the importance of data. I mean in all four of these, right? And also the importance of software throughout all of this, security throughout all of this. So there is sort of another orthogonal, you know, there's another hyperplane going through this that I could have talked about but, but didn't. And I'll, I'll come back to that question because I want to talk a little bit uh, towards the end about uh, interactions between universities and, and industries and, and, and pick your brains here. Okay, so I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, all right, so, so what I want to do is uh, next is I'd just like to dive down into a couple of areas and give you just a few examples. I mean, you don't want me to be up here and telling you about all of the programs that we have. I mean, actually, it doesn't even fit in a slide uh, with small fonts. Uh, but so I'm just going to, I want to sketch at a, at a high level a couple of the areas in which uh, uh, size is making uh, significant investments. And, and, and so let me start with smart systems because I know that this is a priority item here, and certainly something that builds on really 10 years of work that's been going on in cyber physical systems uh, at the National Science Foundation and, and, and within size. And so these are, the, these are the areas that actually we've talked about a number of these before, so smart cities, this notion here of a, up here on the top left-hand side of sort of a, a, a closed loop system where we're sensing, we're bringing in data, we're computing over that, and then there's some kind of action, whether it's steering sensors or whether it's positioning resources or allocating resources, um, sort of that uh, sense, compute, uh, actuate, cycle, uh, smart and connected health, and we, we've talked about both, both of these two just a little bit before. Uh, so the foundations behind, underneath that, uh, there's a long history of investment within size in the areas of cyber physical systems, so we're about to celebrate the 10th anniversary uh, uh, this coming year of uh, a, a program in cyber physical systems. And you know, I think the key words here, pervasive computing, sensing and control, of course, but this notion of high assurance, right? And, and so 
I think when we have these embedded systems, um, uh, safety and security by design has been sort of a theme here of, of, of cyber physical systems. And so that's where a lot of formal methods are coming into play uh, in terms of design. Uh, the National Robotics Initiative, so folks here I know know a lot about that. Um, this is uh, about to celebrate its fifth anniversary and the notion of uh, NRI 2.0 um, and maybe a continued evolution. So NRI was primarily, you see co-robots here that work beside and work cooperatively with people. I think probably a, a, a focus on autonomy will be, uh, you know, be integrated into this picture. And this is a great example where there are a lot of um, uh, cross-agency efforts. So certainly NSF is very involved uh, in this, not just size, but engineering and other directorates, uh, working with NASA, with USDA, um, and also with NIH. And I think, you know, again, thinking about uh, relative, well, thinking about two things, right? Thinking about budget growth, which is, you know, upwards but modest, but also thinking about how interdisciplinary we are it's really these kinds of collaborations that are going to be very important in the future, I think. Question about that? Yeah. Without being, and thank you for, without being critical, I, I would allege that within something like NRI, NSF clearly gets it. Uh -huh. I think NASA does too. I'm not sure about the next two on the list. Uh, USDA and NIH? Hmm. Uh, I guess I could say, uh, you know, in talking, I, I will tell you that in talking with the program managers here, the USDA is, is, is relatively new and something that people are excited about. I don't, honestly, I don't know if they, if they sort of get that or not. And the NIH and robotic surgery, is, again, I don't, so maybe I could ask you in, what's, what, what's the, um, in what sense don't they get, get well, that? I think there's a, often a, let's, how do we understand the underpinnings of human physiology and biology? Mm -hmm. And the, the notion of robotics to do something as deliberate as surgery is pretty disconnected from that fundamental mm -hmm. notion. Right, because they're primarily more disease oriented and mechanism oriented. So, you know, I think that, I, I, I guess, uh, uh, I understand that comment and I guess one thing that I've heard is that NIH is sort of continuing to evolve and maybe, maybe that's just an area wh where, you know, there, there used to be almost, my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Farnham, uh, that there used to be almost, you know, relatively little and now there's a lot more collaboration between NSF and NIH. And, and so maybe it's just because, again, computing related activities are becoming more, and I could, I could ask Howard about that too, uh, that, that's just more areas of overlap now. Want to say anything? I shouldn't put anybody on the spot. Uh, I, I'd like to say something about USDA. Okay. And USDA has to deal with climate change in a very radical way because we lose so much forest with forest fires and with bark beetles. And mm -hmm. they want to connect it to the building industry so that we can use the wood not to burn it but to use it for construction. Purposes. Okay. And that's a very big challenge because it doesn't deal with the industry as it exists yes, to some degree. And so NSF could be helpful in that application of the community. You know, I, I, I think there's a very, uh, I mean, you get to a very important question, right? So we are funding basic, basic science research, right? And now the question is, how will those science tools be used to inform policy, right? And, and uh, I think that the, the, the tools that we're building, let me give you a great example of this. This has to do with deforestation on a global scale, right? There's an amazing project going on, an expeditions project at the University of Minnesota using machine learning techniques so that you can then now look at aerial imagery and figure out what are burn areas, for example, around the globe, right? So that you can actually look at series of satellite photographs and, and predict because you can never measure you know, boots on the ground, <coughs> those kinds of measurements. That's a case where uh, computing techniques are incredibly important for even getting data in the first place, right? And that data can then inform policy. Um, I, I guess I'd argue that uh, that's sort of where, that's sort of where our work is handed off into the public policy sphere. I don't know if you're arguing that as computer scientists or as citizens we should be involved in that. 
I'm an architect in the Oh, okay. Uh, you're, uh, uh, okay. So l l let me just say that I think that computing has that important cap uh, actually mandate, right, to, to help provide the techniques to make us more informed in our policy decisions. But the policy decisions are made outside the realm of our own technical area, right? I mean, it's, it's sort of a bigger problem that we engage in as citizens. Okay. <coughs> Last question, and then I'll move on. Yeah, thank you. I understand it isn't the primary uh, goal of the mission. Oh, the, the primary mission, the NSF. But I want to take your phrase about uh, taking the results in science into policy making and look at the third bullet under cyber physical systems okay. and uh, take as the cyber physical system sort of everything that's going on that involves computers and computing. Okay. And I, I spend a reasonable fraction of my time terrified by that third bullet, right? Reliability, safety, security, usability, and privacy. And it's, it's trivial to cite from any newspaper these days violations of all of those, essentially. And I don't know whether there's any way to improve from the foundation's perspective uh, uh, somehow informing actual policy as opposed to the research itself. I mean, we're able, we're able in the research to create capabilities. And then they seem to get picked up very readily, right, because you can make money on them. And then these control things, which are very important, which you're funding research on, get left alone. Does it feel like a disconnect? Right, so I, I, I think maybe if I could mis maybe possibly mischaracterize what you're saying is that, you know, we, we see that there, are these, that there are these problems, we have certain solutions, we throw them over the fence and then they're just sort of used and, and that we, we don't infuse the policy discussion, right? And, and I don't know if Doug is here. I mean, you, you, you have on your, your, one of your new chairs, is, he's like the perfect person, you know, to, so he's not here. Uh, to, I mean, he's addressing exactly those kinds of questions, right? So that when, so, so he was the, he was the CT, he was the CTO of the FCC. Matter of fact, I think he was the first CTO mm -hmm. of the FCC. One of my former students was also a, the CTO of the FCC. And when we're able to bring those people into the policy discussion, the policy discussion is much richer and much more well informed. But their their job is to be engaged in that policy discussion. They bring the, I think they bring the knowledge and the results of what we're doing so it can inform it. So, um, but I guess I, I, I sort of think of that as it's, the, it's computer scientists involved in the policy level type discussion. Okay. Okay, actually it's, it's, it's great to be discussing this because I know that the whole purpose of this forum is not for me to tell you about what's going on at NSF or what NSF is funding, but we're really talking about technology and, 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 and science and policy also. Okay. So I appreciate those questions. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so I wanted to say just a, a little bit about sort of experimental uh, systems research going on here. There was a project that was started in probably circa 2006 or seven called Genie, which was a sort of networking related project initially. The idea there was how to run uh, experiments meaning allowing people access, allowing people to sort of define their own router functions and program them and implement them at scale, uh, at national scale. Notions of virtualization and how you could sort of get slices all the way across the network of routers that you could program and then end systems that would be uh, providing traffic into that. Uh, not too far after that, the, uh, through OSTP and the White House, there was an effort that NSF really took the lead on called US Ignite, and the idea here was to get uh, gigabit or 100 megabit plus connectivity out to the edges to enable high bandwidth applications to flourish, right? So really to put the capabilities there, one of these build it and, and uh, help people come and, and, and focus on those problems. And then most recently, and this was actually, this was done under, launched under Farnham and I chaired the committee that he appointed to sort of look into these things. So it's a little incestuous, I guess, to, to put this up. But NSF Future Cloud that was looking, uh, if you will, at taking the idea, some of the ideas that were here in Genie and, and then had already been involved in, evolved in Genie to include data centers and at the edge now to extend virtualization 
not just of the network, but end to end through the cloud and giving people access to experimental systems researchers, experimental access to facilities, all the way from bare metal all the way up, depending on where they wanted to do, uh, do their research. And so we funded two of these uh, efforts last year, uh, one called Cloud Lab and one called Chameleon. I probably don't need to go into the details here. They had to do with resource sharing and, and, and virtualization and software defined sort of everything. Um, and I guess what uh, the last thing I wanted to say here, so think of the pieces that we're assembling here, the network, data centers for experimental research. These are awards that we've made just within the last, uh, several of them just within the last few months. Maybe I'll call out these two in particular, which are looking at uh, experimental wireless systems where you can use LTE over existing uh, phones. And now what we've got is, well, we've got wireless, we've got computing, We've got networking, all sliced, all virtualized, and you have experimental access to that. Certainly on a, on a, on a scale of, of a city, uh, I want to combine that now with some activities going on in uh, 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 SATSI, our, our secure and trustworthy cyberspace activity here. It's a partnership between SIZE, uh, SBE, Social Behavioral and Economic Sciences, Education, engineering and math and physical sciences, so a very interdisciplinary um, activity here. This is funded at like $70 million a year, so we, we put a lot of money into cybersecurity. I will tell you that when we go through budget exercises, and you probably do this at universities where you say, well, you know, if you cut so much here, what would you do less? This is an area where we never do less, right? It's just a given that this is going to be growing because it's, it, it's so important. So if we combine all of these things, uh, I think it sort of points out some real opportunities. So we talked about how we have slice virtualized deep programmability uh, within the network. We talked about how we've got connectivity to the edge. We talked about how we can now slice and virtualize clouds. And now I'm talking about experimental infrastructure available to the research community. We've got applications now coming from smart and connected cities. Uh, US Ignite was the project that I talked about second ago. We've got software-defined radios, software-defined networks, software-defined interchanges, the infrastructure just all being software-defined network functions virtualization. Uh, we've got these local wireless test beds, for instance, that can give us campus connectivity to experimental uh, LTE, then linking us to clouds uh, at the edge and clouds deeper back. Uh, maybe we can get some regional ubiquity. So. I didn't realize Pitt and CMU were quite so close. I was going to use it as an example that, you know, now we have the experimental capabilities on a campus scale, for instance, to be running LTE locally, uh, to have computing behind it, computing right at the edge for very low latency services, and computing deeper back in the cloud. What happens when you walk off the Carnegie Mellon campus and you're sort of outside the footprint of that sort of local um, uh, wireless umbrella? You're walking from here to Pitt. Let's just imagine there's some space in between where there's not, you're not over, you know, under one of those two umbrellas, well, maybe we can fall back on some form of uh, carrier participation here through mobile network virtual operators. So now we've got all of these pieces sort of in place to, and if you think about this now in a smart cities context, we've got all of these pieces in place for experimental infrastructure for ubiquitous wireless skin, so accessing uh, services and applications wirelessly. Uh, they're sliceable, they're programmable. Uh, and to me, that's a, I mean, it makes a great sort of end-to-end -end platform for experimentation for smart cities and, and uh, other applications. I want to just leave that with you as, a, as an idea. Okay, I was going to talk a little bit, uh, you know, there have been great questions and I want to provoke even a few more. So I'm not going to talk, I'm, I don't really want to talk, I don't have time to talk about some of the work going on in data science, from data to knowledge to, uh, to action. I'll simply say that this is an activity that's going on across the foundation. These are some of the larger scale projects that have a lot to do with data. There's at least one from every directorate uh, across the foundation, so it's, it, it's very, very important. Uh, and I was going to talk a little bit our, about our size specific programs, but I think I'll skip through that. Uh, and I'm going to also skip quickly just to say, again, because I know how important this is here in 
I made the pitch that this is sort of the area where we may see the biggest advances, but certainly augmenting human capabilities here, uh, and, and I won't go through these. And I wanna sort of finish up with education and then come back to challenges. Um, one of the things that I think Farnham and I and uh, really the whole foundation are incredibly proud of is what size has done in the education space, especially in the K-12 education space. So starting, um, starting next year, starting in 2016, there's gonna be a second AP exam called Computer Science Principles. Um, the idea here, uh, you know, we, we have an existing AP course and you know, for as long back as I can remember in our, in our universities, we have sort of a very well-defined technical track through our program, you know, where you take CS1, CS2, data structures. I mean, many of you may have been through a program like that. The goal here was to really try and broaden, uh, broaden the entryways, if you will, into computer science as a major, and, and also address the pipeline issue, right? So how do we get kids interested in computer science? Um, when I was in Massachusetts, I was involved in some of our statewide education activities to push computing. There are 118 districts in Massachusetts. So if you want to change something, there's 118 places you have to go. So that's clearly not scalable at a national level if you really want to uh, create change. And so Jan Cooney, who's the program manager who worked on this, had what I think was a brilliant observation. She said, if we want to change what's going on at a national scale, we need to embed changes sort of systemically in so something that crosses the country, right? Because we can't go to 118 school districts in, in Massachusetts and 200 in Pennsylvania and on and on and on. And so her, I think her brilliant insight was to say, ah, we can, we can get this going through the AP exam, right? And so this is a new AP exam again um, that, uh, well, well I should just tell you what CS10K stands for. So when Jan first told me about this in 2008, we were colleagues together at UMass for a while and friends and she said, well, you know, the goal is to have 10,000 teachers trained to teach 10,000 computer science courses at 10,000 high schools. And I, when she first told me that, I just said, you're absolutely crazy. You know, how could we possibly do that? Well, you know, we're not going to make it by 2016, but we're not going to be too many years off in actually reaching that goal, right? And uh, you probably read that or, or heard that the mayor of New York said that you know within the next 10 years, every single school in New York City, so that's 1,800 schools, 1.1 million students, will have the ability to take computer science courses, right? And actually, this particular um, uh, computer systems principles course is is one that we're actually funding a, a very large scale uh, deployment and testing and evaluation of that in in New York. I think it's an incredibly exciting activity and uh, I, I think we're going to be seeing the repercussions of this. That's, I, that sounds bad. Uh, yes? Well, in Pittsburgh, when you go to a school, you go to security. They check your bag. Okay. You go to the school room, it has no daylight, no natural ventilation. They have no understanding of the environment. Okay? And if they are trying to teach physics, chemistry, math, and engineering, they are not in the environment which makes it clear to them that these things are even yep. so, I so mean, we wrote an NSF proposal on that issue uh -huh. on the RET, Research Experience for Teacher. Yep, I know that program. Yes. So I'd like to work with you on this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's, yes, I would. I mean, I, I know that program in that I've had, when I was a faculty member, I had science teachers come and work with me. That's how I know the program. But I, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. I would appreciate it. Okay, that great. Much. Sounds great. Okay. All right, okay, so, so uh, we're doing a lot with, with alliances also, so many of you have probably heard of NCWIT, for example, something that got started uh, actually quite a while ago, but you know, with NSF being a very key partner in helping to get that up and running, it's really taken off since then. So I just wanna say, I wanna leave you with a message that we're doing a lot in, in, in um, uh, education also that we're all very proud of. And, and I wanna finish up uh, in, in the five minutes that are left, just with a couple of challenges. So if you haven't read this report, you should. It, it's, it's something that you can sort of sit back and just read on your couch. It's not hard to read, but it's sobering. So you better be in a good mood when you start it, I think. Because it, it's, it's really a call to action. It's talking about the level of investment that we make as a country 
in, in science and engineering uh, research. This, this isn't working, but that sort of dark red line there is the United States. What's being plotted on the y-axis is the percentage of uh, GDP that's invested in R&D uh, by the federal government and companies. And you see that we're sort of flat there at 2.5%. You see other countries, uh, Korea, one which is making an amazing amount of investments, whether that's the hockey sticking, yellow one there, and China is in black on the bottom, right? And, and so this report, one of the things this report points out is it's really calling for uh, investments. It also calls for rethinking this industry, academia, federal government, uh, uh, relationship that has been going on now really since the post Sputnik, uh, post -Sputnik era. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about collaborations with, with, uh, with industry. And this is another, I'll, I'll just talk about one program here. So the goal here is to rethink what's, what can NSF do in terms of helping to deepen and, and, um, and extend that partnership that's been so special in the United States about the interactions between universities, industries, and the role of the federal government there. And let, I'll just give you one example of, uh, uh, and, and actually Farnham started this, the uh, NSF Intel Partnerships, which started in cyber physical systems. Now we have another one in visual experiential computing. This is how this works. Um, that if you're a PI, and this has to do with security and cyber physical systems, you want to submit a proposal, so we had a solicitation for it. And on the solicitation were all the NSF program managers, but, uh, but also Chris Ramming, who, it, who works at Intel, he used to be a DARPA program manager. Uh, and when you're a PI and you submit your proposal, you could submit it and say, oh, I want to do this the usual NSF way. It'll have a panel and nobody from Intel will see this. Or you could check a box, so it's opt-in, and you can say, I want Intel, or it's fine for Intel to look at this. So there are some Intel observers who sort of sit on the side. They don't actively participate in the panel. Uh, they, you know, we go through the very rigorous NSF review process uh, that I think NSF is known for. And NSF makes its decisions and the Intel managers then have agreed to match the amount of NSF investment for their, with their own sort of bilateral funding that goes from Intel flowing into the university in, the, in this area. So IP and things like that are negotiated between Intel and the university, and it's sort of a second uh, link, if you will. You know, here's the university, here's Intel, here's the university, here's NSF. And, and to me, this is a very, very attractive, I mean, I think it's a, a, a really nice idea. We're still learning how well it works and, and what some of the gotchas might be. But it, it sort of highlights NSF's role as a convener. We're getting all the best ideas coming in from the community. Uh, a, a, an industry is able to sort of see those and make and make their sort of separate investments. So it's a way of augmenting what NSF is already doing and sort of again capitalizing on what NSF can do as a uh, as a convener. Okay, so we talked before about other collaborations. The very last thing I want to say, and then, and then I'll, I'll I'll stop is I just want to say a word about education. And now not education at K through 12, but education here at the university. So this was a talk that Ed Lazowska and I gave at, at the um, last summer at the Snowbird Workshop, which is where all the computer science uh, chairs and deans uh, get together. So it was, well, I'm sure you're seeing this here, right? So this is our undergraduate programs, and oh, there's this tidal wave of students coming towards us, right? Um, oh, here are my figures, right? So I. I we just actually became a school of information and computer science at UMass, right? Just uh, uh, at the beginning of this academic year. And when we were trying to sort of push how important computing was, I mean, you've already done this, right? But we were going through this, right? Trying to convince our provost and chancellor how important computing was for the whole campus, right? And, and, the, and you know, how many, and the number of students who were wanting to take our courses are taking our courses. So these are our majors as a function of time. And uh, I was actually pretty good friends with our chancellor since I, was, I wasn't in academic, academic administration, so I wasn't ever asking him for anything anymore. I used to do that. Uh, and so we would just go have lunch. And so I was trying, but of course I'm trying to sell him stuff, right? And so I'm trying to sell him on this notion of how important computing is, and I used this graph. And he said, oh, you know, I know, I, I actually I didn't, show him this graph, I said, well, you know, we used to be 500, now we're almost, almost 1,000, we've almost doubled. So I didn't show him the graph. 
because uh, you know it's it's more complicated than that, right? And he says, ah, I've, I know the graph you're talking about, and I know what the periodicity is, and it's about to turn over, right? And so <laughs> we went through we went through all these arguments about why it's now fundamental, why uh, all the things we've been talking about, how computing is is important for so many different disciplines. He got that, right? Of course, because you know he's created a college. You know, at the time he said. So I actually pulled this graph out because I had it, right? And he says, oh, you know, I know, you know, you want me to say, you want me to say, oh, there's a positive slope there. And then what I said to him is I said, you know, no, actually a quadratic is a way better fit and you should be <laughs> investing even more in us. Uh, but in the end, I mean, he made, a, the, the university made a very substantial investment. And, and so I think there's a ten, tangible sense on all campuses that what we're seeing in student interest is different this time around. Students have broader interests. We're, we're getting people coming in. I mean, I'm sure you're seeing this here, right? We have people coming into our machine learning class from all different disciplines, right? And you know, graduate students from all across campus trying to get into these courses. And I think it speaks to the, the broad impact that we have. So let me tell you one thing that keeps me up at night. Uh, so I've been thinking about this. I think I have personally seen, uh, because I like to travel and talk to people, I remember three years ago, going around and being on a review committee at three different universities where the chancellor and the provost said exactly what my chancellor and provost said, and I couldn't convince them, right? And they would deal with the, the problem of, or, or the challenge of, of over-enrollments and, and a lot of student demand by allocating lecture positions, right? Because they say, oh, it's going to turn over. I think that's changed, right? And if you read around in the newspaper, like, you know, Harvard got a big endowment so that they can add some dozen faculty members, and there are a number of other schools, I won't name them, that are all also very good schools and are making you know, significant double-digit you know, double uh, investments in faculty. I think we may see the number of tenure-track faculty increase very significantly three or four years from now. Right? Um, I wonder what that means for us as NSF, right? That, I mean, these are really good people. Right? These are going to be really good people at really good schools. We're going to have a larger group of PIs. We're going to have a larger impact for computer science. Right? Um, if you read, if you like to think about university administration and resource allocation and stuff like that, I, I'd encourage you to read this paper. It's really, uh, do I have a picture of it? No, I don't have a picture of it. Rescuing Biomedical Research from Its Systemic Flaws. It's a discussion. Uh, the people who wrote it are, are leading lights in their fields, um, and it talks about the consequences of biomed having grown a lot and then flattened out uh, in terms of the amount of research. And so now, for instance, your R1 grant from NIH, we were talking about NIH before, you're 43 on average when you get your first solo grant, right? Now, I, I, I can be honest enough with myself to think about when I did my best work and when I might have been most creative. and we might want to all reflect on that. So some of us are greater than 43 when that happens. Some of us are less. But you know, we've got a lot of fertile minds there that aren't engaged in their own independent research up to age 41 there, right? And, and so th th there's a really, really, I mean, there's a lot of differences between biomed and computer science. And when I first read this, I read it and I thought it was interesting. And then I read it again. And every time it said biomed, I put computer science in, in my mind and tried to argue why we were different. But it's, it's, it's really interesting, I think, something we should be thinking about as a discipline. Okay, the last thing. There's one tidal wave. Here's another tidal wave that's going to hit us. I talked about CS10K, the broadening of, computer, uh, of interest in computing from, um, uh, from students. And so here's our regular traditional CS programs. Here's maybe another tidal wave we're going to see where we get students who are coming in through computer science principles, they're interested more in the application of computing, and, and maybe that's not an issue here. But I know at some schools, we're still teaching a, our pretty narrow technical major. We've got students who are coming in with broad interest in computing, and how are we gonna how are we gonna handle those folks? What are we gonna do there? Okay, oh, that wasn't a very good animation. Uh, anyway, so there's a number of universities that are experimenting with CS plus X programs or X plus CS programs. I'd be happy to talk offline. Okay, last slide. Uh, this is sort of the mom and pop apple, mom and pop and apple pie slide. Uh, you know, again, really thinking about where we are as a discipline, our intellectual agenda, the impact that we have, 
the importance of computing and cyber infrastructure across all of science and engineering. I mean, we're at a really, really sweet spot uh, right now. And, you know, we've, we've talked, since this is about policy also, you know, we've talked about the dividends to our nation of all of the things we do, both in research uh, and in education, as well as the cyber infrastructure. So with that, uh, I'm sorry I ran over just a few minutes. I apologize for that. But I thank you, really, for all the questions and the, for the discussion uh, as we're going along. I'll be sticking around for a while. I'd love to continue to talk. Thank you, Farnham, for the invitation. <laughs>
uh, uh, National Robotics Initiative and also the Big Data Initiative, bo both were launched. Thanks again, Howard, for everything that you've done. With that, I want to thank Jim for spending the day with us for this thought-provoking talk. Uh, two days with us, that's exactly right. And also for everything that you're doing for our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.